we're going to be looking in the book of Ruth. If you want to be finding your place there in the book of Ruth, the first chapter of Ruth. Generally, I would try to preach a sermon out of the Old Testament and a sermon out of the New Testament, just so i like everybody to know. I know there's two sides of, of that covenant. Uh, but I, I have wrestled with this passage, and I almost preached it this morning. It just didn't seem like the passage to preach uh, for, for Grandparents' Day. Uh, now, some of you may relate to this. We're going to look at this subject on bitterness. And we do know some, some older folks that maybe have gotten a little bit bitter. Uh, so maybe it could fit, but I, I didn't want to do that this morning. But as, as Jim was singing this, the song that he just sang, we think about all of these folks that have gone through so much in life, and then we say, man, what a blessed saint. What, what a blessing it is to see how that they came through, how God delivered them, and, and all of the things that went on. But at the same time, if we were to find ourselves in those very same places, many of us would find ourselves becoming bitter. And I think it's something that we've got to be on guard against. The, the world is filled with negativity today. If you turn on the news, you'll hear more bad news than you will hear good news. And even as Christians, we can fall victim to this bitterness. And I want to look tonight at just this, the, the, the book of Ruth. And we're only going to read just a few verses, but I'm going to kind of talk about the whole book itself. And just to give us some insights into how we can be on guard against bitterness and how we can combat bitterness as it comes into our life, because it's kind of like, uh, kind of like a weed. I mean, it just grows and grows, and uh, if you don't get to the very root of it and get it out, it just keeps coming back. And we've got to be on guard against that. So, if you're with me there in Ruth, chapter number one, I'm going to begin reading in verse number nineteen. Here, the scripture says, "So they too went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem." that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. Lord, this evening, as we look to your word in this, this, uh, this few verses here, and we consider this topic of bitterness that can uh, creep into the life of believers, I pray that you'd put us on guard against it, that we'd be watchful, uh, that uh, as we see bitterness beginning to take root, that we would take action so that we could eradicate it. And Lord, that we can uh, be like the, the saints that uh, we were singing about, thinking about what a blessing it is to know that God is in con total control and that we don't have to let bitterness rule in our lives. Again, I pray that you'll be with me as I present this sermon. It may be a, a blessing to those that have heard it. And Lord, help us to apply the truth in our lives as we go out into this world on Monday morning, uh, knowing that uh, you've commanded us to be witnesses of your love and of your grace. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, a as we look at this, Naomi says, Call me Mara. Why would you bother to call me Naomi? Now, the name Naomi means uh, agreeableness, it means to delight, it means pleasant, it means beautiful, and Naomi says, don't call me Naomi, uh, I'm not any of those things, and she says, instead, call me Mara, now this word Mara, the, the word that's used for it, it means bitter. And what she's saying is, there was a time when I was very agreeable. There was a time when everything was delightful. There was a time when everything was beautiful and wonderful and all of this good stuff was going on. But she says, that was, that was Naomi. Don't call me Naomi anymore. She says, instead, call me Mara. Because the Almighty hath dealt bitterly with me. Uh, she said, I went out full, full of grace, full of beauty. But now that I've come back to Bethlehem, I'm bitter and I'm empty. And a as we think about uh, bitterness, what, what does bitterness mean? Webster says it means to be distasteful or distressing to the mind. It's marked by intensity or severity, often accompanied by pain or suffering, intensely unpleasant. Now, all of us have had experiences that we've said are bitter. We, we've gone through some things and said, 
man, if I'd had my choice, I wouldn't have done that, or if I have my choice, I'll never do that again. These things come into our lives, and they are distasteful. These things come into our life, and it stresses your mind. You know how it is? You lay down at night, and you can't stop thinking about it. You, you know how that is. You, you're trying to occupy your time, trying to do something else, and yet you're, you're still, your mind's just thinking, what can I do? And in, marked by intense severity. Sometimes it's so overwhelming you can't do anything else. I, I know many of you have been in such a place. Uh, and, and this, uh, this uh, bitterness comes in. There's many reasons that we could be uh, bitter, that we could become bitter. And as we look at things that have gone on in, in, say, the past 10 years or so in our country, there's reasons to be bitter. We have had, uh, Brother Lyle mentions the, mentioned this, we've had natural disasters, one after the other after the other. We've seen the, the fires that are raging. We've seen the droughts that have come. We've seen flooding in other parts. We've seen just disaster, natural disaster after natural disaster. And people have lost their homes, their livelihood, and their families have been displaced. And, and you think some of these hurricanes that have come through even in these past 10 years, people are still not back in their homes from all that time ago. Th there's, been, there's been devastation in, on the natural front. We faced uh, financial crises, and we thought it was bad in 08 and 09, then we thought it was bad in 10 and 11, and we thought it was bad, and now you know, here we are in 2015, and folks are still suffering the consequences of this financial crisis. Some even say that this crisis that we're in financially is worse or greater than that of the 1930s. I, I don't know if you're following it or not, but I, I saw recently Puerto Rico is going to, uh, had to default on their debt, and they have no means of going forward to paying off their bill. Uh, I, I mean, this financial crisis is just ongoing, and China keeps going, and some of you thought, man, I'm going to retire. I've got my retirement date down. Just so you know, it's seven years, seven months, and 17 days. Uh, but that's if, if the stock market and everything else goes well, right? We, we make these plans, and, and some of you thought, man, I've got enough, and then whatever happens, right? So we, we see these financial crises. Some, the financial crisis isn't retirements delayed. Some is that they've lost their job. Some have lost their home. Some has lost everything that they've worked for, uh, and it's been terrible. Uh, others we think of, uh, of, of uh, the suffering is more personal. There's the loss of loved ones, husband or wife or mother or, or father or child or grandchild, all of these things are, are going on. There, there are many things in this life that happen to us that if we let them go and we don't deal with them biblically, we can become bitter. Uh, some of these things have happened even with Naomi. Naomi was, had several sources of bitterness. The first source of her bitterness was a bitterness over the past. Her husband came to her, uh, Elimelech, and he says, we are going to leave Bethlehem, the house of bread, and we are going to go down to Moab because of this famine that's in the land. And I'm sure that as Moab told his wife, he said, we're, we're, or as, as Elimelech told his wife, we're going to leave, but it's just going to be for a short time. Just till this, uh, this famine is over, then we'll come back. But when she gets down to, she, she gets down to it, she has to leave. She leaves her home, she leaves her family, she leaves everything that she's familiar with, all of the comforts and all of the relationships that she has, and she follows her husband into Moab, and there things begin to happen. So she's already suffering, loss of relationship, but uh, to leave her home, to leave everything that she knows, uh, she, she's in this strange land. But she sets up a home. Uh, they they get a job that they uh, she begins to raise the children, but then in this new land, something terrible happens. Something tragic. Her husband dies. We're we're not told how he dies. It could be that he went off to a job site and uh, there's something happened and he and he died at work. It could be a lingering illness that had, had crept in on him and he died. It could have been just a sudden, all at once, he died. You know, it really doesn't matter whether it's an accident, whether it's lingering, or whether it's sudden. The death, the loss of a, of a spouse, it, it's tragic. And this is what she is facing uh, a, as she is there. So now she's removed from all of those who could comfort her, and her husband, who took her to this place, 
is now dead. But there's also a source of her bitterness is in the family. She, she's in a desperate state. She's not in her homeland. She doesn't have support of her family or close family. She, her husband is now passed away, and she's fi- facing a financial crisis. But she has two sons, Malon and Chilion. I don't know, when, when you read through the Bible, uh, you just kind of blow over those names because we don't pronounce them right. We don't really understand them. and uh, Names are a little different. I know right now there's something on Facebook. You can punch in whatever your name is, and it'll tell you what it means. It, it's a lie. Do you realize, like Abraham Lincoln said, don't believe everything you see on the Internet. All right? But he didn't say that. Or, uh, uh, but, 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 but it's all a lie. It, but for, for these folks, when they gave a name, the name meant something. I, I've often threatened to change my two sons' names to Malon and Chilion. Uh, Malon means sickly, and Chilion means pinely. It means they are not the healthy children. They are not going to be the star athletes at Moab High School. These kids are sickly. So not only has her husband passed away, but her two sons, Malon and Chilion, they are sickly, but still they find a wife. Maybe Naomi thinks things are going to start turning around. Things are going to start getting better now. My boys uh, have wives, and they'll have children, and I'll have grandchildren, and and things will start turning around for me while I'm here in Moab. And yet what we read is that these two boys die. And they seem to die together, and they seem to die suddenly. Not, not of their, maybe of their illness, but maybe not. But they, they seem to have died together. They seem to die suddenly. And now uh, they also have died without uh, having any children. So now Naomi is without a husband. She's without her children. She's without grandchildren. She's without a homeland. And she is finding herself in this place. And if you dwell on those things, could you, could you understand where maybe a little bitterness might come up? So, so it finally comes to the place where she says, I am going to go back home. You know, sometimes you get to that spot, say, I am done with this. This is not what I signed up for. This is not what I had planned. There's no reason for me to stay where I'm at. It's time for me to change course. And sometimes we need to just turn around and kind of go back to our roots. Well, uh, Naomi thinks, I am going to go back into Bethlehem. There's nothing in Moab for me. I'm going to go back where at least I have some relationship. I have some family. I have some kin. And so she goes back to Bethlehem. And she enters the city with her daughter-in-law, Ruth, and you, you know how that worked. Both of the daughter-in-laws were going to stay, and, and Ruth told, or Naomi said, no, I don't want you to. Uh, but Ruth st- stayed with, and she, she it, the scripture talks about how she clung, she clings to uh, Naomi, and she's going to stay with her and go with her. And she said, your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. So uh, Ruth says, I am going to go with you back to Bethlehem. And so they come into the city, and all the city is abuzz. You know what? They're, they're all looking. They say, is that Naomi? I, is that her? I kind of remember she, she didn't look quite like that. Y- you ever pull up old photos, and you see yourself 10 years later? And it's like, wow, I used to be that skinny. Uh, I used to have that much hair. I used to do this or do that kind of a thing, right? So, so maybe Naomi comes in there, and do you think that dealing with Leaving her homeland, lo- uh, losing her husband, losing her sons. Do you think all of that might have a little bit of an effect on her? We, we've seen people that have suffered under severe stress, and you, you see hair turns gray, wrinkles grow, things begin to change, and you look at them and say, man, they, they've been under some stress. They've been under some trouble. Well, no doubt as Naomi comes back, there are some there, and they're looking to say, that looks like Naomi, I'm just not sure. And, and the whole city is a buzz. Naomi is coming back. Naomi has come back, and uh, they, they look at her. And uh, she says, I went out full. I had household goods. I had a husband. I had my children. But now I come back empty. And she says, because God, had, well, let, let's read that uh, verse again. She She said in verse 21, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye 
me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. She says, God is punishing me. God has put me under this uh, this terrible strain, and she returns empty. It's possible Elimelech might have sold the property that they had in Bethlehem, thinking he would come back in the year of Jubilee, which is the year that Naomi returns, to buy back the property. But Elimelech didn't live to the year of Jubilee. There, there was no way for him to redeem the land that he'd sent off. And now Naomi has no funds, so she can't do it of her, of her own accord. And so it's a, it's a tough time for her. She's just another widow, and as she looks at the past, she sees no reason to have any hope, no reason to feel anything except bitterness. But then it's also a bitterness looking at the future. See, sometimes if we get so focused on the bad things that have happened in our past, it kind of skews our view of the future, and we can't see the good things that are coming. And even the future will cause bitterness. The Jewish custom was to leave the corners of the field unharvested. So as you, you have your plot out there, your land, whatever it would be, you would leave the corners, and you could leave the corners as big or as small as you would want. And then the widows and the, the fatherless and the strangers and those that had no means, they would come into your field after you gleaned, and they would pick in the corners. And so they would gather up. That was how they took care of one another. So uh, they would go and they would gather. She comes at the time of this feast that she could gather, but as she sits there, she thinks, I'm just this poor widow. Once I was full, and now I'm empty. Uh, and uh, uh, she, she's so focused on that, she sees no reason to hope. And she thinks that God is against her, that God is afflicting her. From her perspective, she has nothing. And what hopes do you have for a future if you are looking at the past and you, you dwell on these things? Th the thing with bitterness is bitterness is a sin. Now, we, we talk about sin and we think, well, lying is a sin. Stealing is a sin. Adultery is sin. You know, we have our, our, our list of sin. But do you realize that the scriptures teach us bitterness is sin? And as we go through the things in this life, there are many things that the world will say, well, you should be bitter. You have every right to be bitter about these things. But the Bible tells us that bitterness is sin. And if bitterness is sin, we have no right to it. It's just like God told Adam and Eve, don't touch or don't don't eat of that fruit of the tree. We shouldn't go near it. And somebody says, oh, you have a right. Bitterness, it'll make you feel you, you just need to get angry, get good and angry. It'll make you feel better. Don't believe that. Bitterness is sin. It's encouraged by the world because the world says, well, somebody hurts you. You can hurt them back. The world says, well, if God has taken away your husband and God has taken away your home and God has taken away this and taken away that, then you have every right to be angry and bitter against God. God has forsaken you. you you've heard people say, say as much. Maybe they don't use those words. But don't they come to you and say, I thought you believed in God. Wh where's your God at this time? Well, why did God let this happen to you? Why didn't God stop that? And you know what they're telling you? God has forgotten you. God has forsaken you. That you are on your own. But nothing could be further by the truth, uh, further from the truth, because we're enlightened by the word. By the word, we need to kind of move away from the world and move into the word. This is what is true. The world's opinions change day by day, but God's word doesn't change. And we need to look to see what God says about these things. And God says, God does not downplay your losses. Please don't go to someone who, who is suffering and say, well, it's really not that bad. They don't need to hear that because it is that bad for them. Don't go to someone who, who, who has lost a job and say, oh, you can get another job. Uh, my, my uncle lost a job and he was fine. That, that's not what we're... God does not downplay the losses. The losses of a loved one hurt us. The loss of jobs hurt us. The loss of relationships, they all hurt us. Don't downplay the hurt, but do not let bitterness take root. 
and so many Christians that are unlearned in the Scriptures. Our churches are filled with people who claim to be Christians that never read the Word of God and don't have any clue what God says on most subjects. Hey. Amen, brother. Oh. Hey, I'm telling you the truth, am I not? We, we, we have a nation full of people that call themselves Christian and have no idea what it means to be a Christian according to the Bible. And I, I told somebody this this morning, most churches are nothing more but a bar with no alcohol. You just come in, you just do whatever you want. The same as you do out in the world, there's just no drinking. And everybody, everybody thinks they're all good, and they leave the same way they come in. In this church, we're giving you the Word of God, and we're challenging you to measure your life, not according to my standards or pastor's standards, but according to the standards of God. And God says that we are called to be above that. And we need to be people who study the Word of God so that we can let it live and work in our lives. If you don't read it, you can't remember it. If you don't read it, you can't live it. If you don't read it, you can't share it. That's what we're called to be about. And, and so let's, let's move away from the, the world says, oh, you deserve it. You, you should be bitter. Let's look at what the Word of God says. And it says that it is sinful. James chapter 3, I'll, I'll read these verses to you because I'm going to run out of time. Uh, James chapter 3, verse 14 through 16. It says, But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. I know the verse's main focus is dealing with envy and strife, but if you have bitterness in your heart, it will bring envy and strife. You'll start thinking, well, why do they have what I don't have? You'll start thinking, well, I'm going to take what they have and it will become mine. We've got to be on guard against bitterness. Envying others leads to strife, and it's all rooted in bitterness. Uh, Naomi returns to Bethlehem. She sees the markets filled. She sees people with grandchildren. She sees other people with their homes, and all of their lives are going along, and she declares it's not fair. God hates me. God is against me, and I have every right to be bitter. But bitterness is sin. Hebrews twelve fifteen, the Scriptures say, Looking diligently, lest any man fell of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You know, if you let just a root of bitterness into your heart, into your life, it doesn't just affect you. It affects all those people that you come in contact with. Do you think Naomi was a very pleasant woman to be around? I don't believe so. She told her daughter-in-law, I don't want anything to do with you. Go on, go back to where you came from. Yet Ruth stayed with her. Uh, I bet day after day it was a struggle. Maybe some of you have dealt with folks that are so bitter against everything in this life, and you, you know what that is like. But uh, Ruth stayed with her. If you and I do not root out the bitterness in our life, it doesn't only affect us, it affects all those that you come in contact with. And how many people uh, have this bitterness that's in them, and then they go and try to be a witness for someone. You know, I hate this, and I hate that, and I hate this, and I'm bitter against this, and I'm angry against this, and this isn't fair, and God's against me. Hey, you ought to come down to our church. It's such a wonderful place. It, it doesn't work. You're, you're not going to be an influence for good. That bitterness comes up, and they'll say, if that's Christianity, I don't want any part of it. Bitterness is sin, and we've got to be on guard against it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Let all bitterness be put away. This is the commands of the Scripture. The world says you have every right to be angry. The scripture says you have none. We need to recognize that bitterness is sin and put it away. Bitterness is the mark of unrighteousness. Romans chapter number 3, 
verse uh, 10 through 14. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. You know the mark of a person that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior is bitterness. Let it not be once named among us. Let it not once be named among those who say we follow Jesus Christ, that he is in us and we are in him. Uh, and again, I'm not telling you do, to pretend that nothing bad's happened or nothing tragic has happened in your life. Each and every one of us faces some pretty bad things, some pretty tragic things. And we think, well, it's not as bad as so-and-so or, or so-and-so's got it worse than me or maybe they don't have it worse than you. I'm not telling you that you don't face terrible things, but I'm telling you do not let the root of bitterness take hold because it is sin. Bitterness is a choice. Naomi got so wrapped up in her bitterness, she failed to recognize the truth that God was there, that God was with her, that God loved her so wrapped up in all of the bad things, and she's listening to the, the people in this world telling her that there's no use to go on. Why do you hold to your faith? She couldn't see the reason. She couldn't see God because she's so focused on all these other things. And, and again, I, I recognize famine is hard. Loss of the husband, the loss of the relationships, the loss of the children, all of these things are devastating. But let's not focus so much on the past that we can't see that God holds the future, that God is our source of joy. If, if, if your joy is wrapped up in the things that you have or in the relationships that you maintain, what do you do when you don't have those things? Our joy, my joy, your joy should be in the Lord. He gives us what is true joy. So Naomi didn't understand it. She couldn't see it all. She thought God had forsaken her. But God was working out his plan of salvation through her life. Now, I, I don't know if you ever go through and you try to put all of these things together, but you, you think about this. Naomi leaves with her husband. Her husband dies. Her sons die. A uh, daughter-in-law comes back with her. And she's living the life of a widow, and it's a, it's a terrible and it's a difficult way to live. But then Boaz steps in. And when Boaz steps in, he says, who is this beautiful woman? He looked at Ruth, and, and he said, this is the girl of my dreams. This is the girl that I want to marry. And he gives her good gifts, and those good gifts come to Naomi. And Naomi says, where did you glean today? She knew there was no way you get that kind of uh, gleaning uh, from, from just a leftover field. And then Boaz takes Ruth to be his wife. And Boaz gives birth to a son. Naomi becomes a grandma. And then that son, whose name is Obed, has a son whose name is Jesse, who has a son whose name is David, and is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that God was working out his plan of salvation in Naomi's life, and she had no idea that it would lead to you and I knowing who Jesus is? We look at these tragedies and we think nothing good can come of it, but we all know Romans 8, 28. We need to learn 8.29 and 8.30. Let me read those to you. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Everything's going to work out for good. That doesn't mean everything is good. The scripture goes on in verse 29 says, For whom he, for whom God did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, 
whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? God has a plan for your life, and even if you can't fully see the end of it from where you're at, we've got to trust him. He's called us. He is justifying us. He is going to glorify us. He has blessings in store for us even when we go through tragedies in this life. There is no reason for a Christian to be bitter. Everything God does is to conform us to the image of his son. Uh, And if we put our faith and trust in him, who's going to be against us? Paul goes on in Romans 8, 35, says, who shall separate us? See, we, we can have people that don't like us, but they can't, they can't stand against us. God is for us. Who can be against us? And then he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you realize what he's saying? There's nothing tall enough to keep God and us separated. There's nothing deep enough to keep God and us separated. There's nothing wide enough to the right or to the left that will keep us separated from God there is no power on earth there's no power in heaven there's nothing that was known at that day there's nothing known today and nothing that will be known in the future that can separate us from the love of God and if God loves us we do not need to be bitter God's love for us is so that we'll be conformed to the image of his son I thought I broke something there for a second. Uh, so that we'll be, uh, we'll be conformed to the image of his son. His son was hated, and yet he held no bitterness to those that crucified him. He held no bitterness against you and I who were sinners, knowingly living in rejection of his love. You and I have no reason to be bitter. Instead, we need to focus on the good. And then we need to forgive the wrongs. Naomi had this thought that God was against her. But then she started seeing that God's in control, God had a plan, and that she had not been forsaken. And we start we need to start looking at that. Now you and I will struggle because Naomi I- is mad at God. Naomi says my husband is gone, my house is gone, uh, my children are gone. All of these things are gone and it's a little easier sometimes to forgive things like that. But when we start talking about people, well, you don't know what they did to me. Well, you know what they said about me. Do you know what they did at work? Do you know this? Do you? you know, we're called to forgive the people that have done wrongs. And if we're going to overcome bitterness, we must be forgiving. Uh, Ephesians 4, 31, 32, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You and I have wronged people too, and they've forgiven us. Let us be forgiving as Christ has commanded. Uh, Jesus said, I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. What would Jesus do? He's not going to get bitter. He's going to love them. And he's going to show them that. So this evening, I'd ask you these three questions. Can you name a person that has hurt you? Can you name a person whose company you enjoy the least of everyone? Can you name a person that you would most enjoy watching fail in this life. See, if you have people in mind, you've let a root of bitterness take hold. It's dangerous. It's sinful. 
and we need to be forgiven. Maybe God has put that particular person in your life to help you grow as a Christian. And what you need to be doing is praying for them, blessing them, doing good unto them, and stop waiting for them to fail. It brings you to envy. It brings you to wrath. And it's all because of that root of bitterness that's in your soul. We need to be people who recognize the blessings that God has given us. Now, again, I, I'm not saying pretend like nothing bad has happened. If somebody's been stealing from you, you don't say, well, come on over. I'm going to be gone this weekend. Take whatever you want. Uh, you, you need to be uh, rather wise about these things. But let's not hold things against people. We need to be forgiving. And we can't let bitterness take hold because if we do, it's sin. And if we do, it robs us of our joy. And we're to be the most joyous people on this earth. Our sins are forgiven. Uh, we're being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We're on our way to heaven. We have the promises of God. And yet we sit around like, you know, uh, I don't want to make fun of anybody. Uh, what, what is it like a, like a, a long-faced mule? Sour and bitter. Uh, we, we don't need to be that way. So uh, I'm going to ask you, go ahead and stand. I'll ask the instrumentalist to come and uh, Brother Ron with our invitation song. M maybe you don't have any problem with bitterness. M maybe everything's just going along in your life. But there, there's probably somebody you know that is suffering from bitterness. Maybe you should come and pray for them. But it, but it is possible even for Christians to suffer for bitterness. If the Lord spoke to your heart, I pray that you'd come and say, Lord, I, I don't want to hold this bitterness any longer. I want to turn it over to you. I want to recognize what blessings that you have for me. I want to be conformed to the image of your son. I want to put away this bitterness, this envying, this wrath. And Lord, I'm just asking you to take that from me so that I can be the Christian you've commanded me to be. I, I think that's worthy to come and pray to the Lord. That's a prayer he will answer. He wants to do good for you. He wants to lift you up so that you can be a witness and a testimony for him. Uh, again, if, uh, if there's any need whatsoever, I'd invite you to come and pray. It doesn't have to be anything about bitterness. Maybe the Lord's talked to you today about something completely different. That, that's perfectly acceptable. Come and pray and ask God to use you instead of being a person of bitterness, but a person of forgiveness, a person of love. Uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll sing an invitation song. Lord, I again, do want to thank you for your word. I thank you for preserving it for us. And as we look uh, to this uh, lesson in the life of Ruth, or the life of Naomi, I do pray you'd help us to make sure that we put away bitterness, that we're the witnesses you've called us to be, that we're forgiving, that we show love and experience the joy and experience life as a Christian who knows that God is in control. Uh, situations are going to come and things are going to uh, distract us, but Lord, help us that as we go through, we keep this root of bitterness from ever taking hold. Uh, just pray that uh, your will and way will be done in this invitation, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.